Okay, so today uh, we will talk about sections of a bundle. Last time we defined bundle, we defined in particular what are vector bundles and principal bundles, which are some specific type of bundles related respectively to uh, vector spaces and to Lie groups. So when we have a bundle, uh, as I promised during the first lesson, we're interested in sections. So here we define sections. So we start with a manifold M and with a bundle E over M with projection pi, and we take an open set over this manifold. And we say that a section of E over U is a smooth map if we are in the smooth category and a holomorphic map in the holomorphic category, uh, such S for a section, that's the standard name, let's say, uh, from U to E, satisfying this extra condition uh, that pi composed S is the identity on U. So what this means is that if you take S of X, this is in the fiber over X. So as an example, when E is the tangent bundle, this is precisely a vector field. And if you want to say denote the set of all sections over an open set, we write like this, S infinity UE. This is usually the same notation that one uses to just mean all smooth maps from U to E, not just sections. Uh, but yeah, when, when E is a bundle, it's sometimes common to write this, and we know that these are the sections. And if we're talking about holomorphic sections, because E and M are complex manifolds, uh, then we write this. Uh, I will not do it, but sometimes this is written also capital gamma UE, and whether we're talking about smooth or holomorphic, it's from context. So of course, if these are complex manifolds or not, or sometimes people put it here, they will write either C infinity or this whole, or where this dot is. And when our open set U is the all of M, so we talk about sections over M, we call this a global section because of course it's defined globally on the all of M. And um, of course, when E itself is, for instance, a vector bundle, uh, then the set of sections, either we're talking smooth or holomorphic, is also a vector space. Of course, because you can add uh, fiber wise. So we saw that uh, a vector bundle, or not just a vector bundle, any bundle is defined by its fibers and by its transition functions. Um, so this next proposition tells us that this section, you can think of the sections are as, uh, so global sections, you can think global sections as uh, um, gluing of sections of trivial bundles. So let, let me, write exactly what I mean. So we start with a bundle E over some manifold M with fiber F and structure group G. Uh, we take U alpha phi alpha a trivializing atlas, trivializing atlas for E with transition functions G alpha beta. Uh, now we take an open set. And we take a section smooth section of this uh, bundle over U. And we write uh, this S alpha as the projection on the second component, so on the fiber of the trivialization of S. So S goes from U into E, but let's just say, so. Uh, so this is only true on U alpha. 
intersected u in principle. Uh, so if you take a point in u alpha intersected u, this goes over, so this map S goes from u alpha intersected u to uh, E. And then when we use phi alpha, this goes to the tri trivialization. Uh, so we're going into u alpha intersect the u times f, and then we project onto f. Okay, and this is what we called our s alpha. Um, and the result here is that we have that s alpha is g alpha beta. And remember, this is an element of the group which acts in the, on f. So we act with it on s beta. So this is kind of expected uh, in the sense that S alpha and S beta represent the same object S. Um, so when you have this local data, S alpha, S beta, they should vary just like if they were uh, vectors. So according to these transition functions. Uh, there is a vice versa though. So if you have some sections here, so if you have this S alpha such that S alpha from U alpha intersected U in F is smooth and it satisfies S alpha equal G alpha beta times S beta. And again, this is the action. Then there exists a unique uh, section, like a real section, such that S alpha is precisely. Uh, the local data of this S. Okay, so it's telling you that if you start with a section, you can get this local data that have this relationship. But otherwise, if you have some local things that satisfy this relationship, then you can glue them together to a bigger section on a bigger open set. And yes, I was telling you I had only I have only one screen today, so I will only use half of the whiteboard, so the proof comes on a new whiteboard. So let's do the first direction. So we take S, this is action. And uh, on S alpha, you have that S of X is nothing but phi alpha inverse, so the trivialization of x comma s alpha of x. Okay, let's let's repeat this slowly. So remember that this is an element in uh, u intersected u alpha times f, right? And by the way we defined it, uh, it must satisfy precisely this relationship. And now it's easy because now we know that if X is actually in U intersected U alpha intersected U beta, uh, then X S alpha of X, which we just said is nothing but uh, phi alpha of S of X. So I'm just inverting this. And I can because this is a different morphism. It's phi alpha of phi beta inverse, because uh, this relationship, of course, is valid also for beta, if x is in u alpha intersected u beta. Uh, but this composition, phi alpha composed the phi beta inverse, that's by the definition of a bundle, nothing but x composed g alpha beta of x times s beta. Of x. Okay, so in particular, S alpha of x is G alpha beta times S beta. Okay. For the vice versa, um, we have this S alpha and we define S of X, so we have to create this S of X. Well, there's really only one way to do it, uh, which is to say, okay, let's just take this. 
And what we have to show is that this is uh, well-defined. No? Of course, if it is well-defined, then it satisfies all the previous things. Um, but what it means well-defined? Well, we have to show that if you take alpha or if you take beta, it's the same. So let's see if that's true. Well, the thing is that we did know, so this is one of the hypotheses here, that this uh, local section satisfy this relationship. So let's use it. Uh, but at the same time, by the definition of uh, the transition function, this is phi alpha inverse. And this phi alpha inverse is from here. But then we can basically use this, this, this equality here, but let's say in the other direction. Um, so this is phi alpha composed phi beta of x is beta of x. This is by the definition of transition function. And now things, of course, just simplify. And this is um, phi beta inverse of x as beta of x. Uh, which proves that this is uh, this function is well defined and it satisfies all the previous conditions just by definition. And um, I've been yes, I've been ready using this word, but let's write it down. The maps as alpha are the so-called local data of S. Local. Um, I lost my. local data of s for this trivialization. Of course, this is linked to the trivialization. No? Uh, we'll often omit this because usually we fix a trivialization. So we just say the local data of s. Okay, and what do sections do for us? Well, for instance, they tell us when um, a vector bundle is trivial. So we take a vector bundle of rank K over M and you in M open. Then E is trivial over m. So trivial over m means, uh, um, eh, sorry, not over m, over u, of course. Uh, trivial over u means that pi inverse of u, so e restricted to u, which is the same as pi inverse of u by definition, is equivalent as bundle to u times r to the k. Yeah? Or, or C to the K, whatever uh, kind of vector bundle we're considering, real or complex. So this isomorphism is uh, isomorphism of vector bundles. If and only if there exist K sections, so S1, SK, sections over U, which uh, uh, are pointwise a basis. Okay. So it is basically, I would say not, not too hard to imagine, because uh, if you have U times RK, 
then uh, you it's very easy to obtain these sections. Uh, you just take the k standard vectors, or well, simply any base of our k, and you just say, okay, independently of u, we have these k vectors, and they're independent, and they form a basis. So one direction, I think it's uh, easy uh, because. Yeah, because of course you have this. Um, okay, so let's do that direction. So if we are trivial over root, then we have this. So let's do this one first, but it's easy. Uh, we just take. So let's give a name to this diffeomorphism. Oh no. Uh, sorry, coming, coming. Eraser. So let's say the psi is this diffeomorphism from u times. Uh, no, let's go from EU from just for consistency. So from E restricted to U to U times RK, this is the diffeomorphism that we were talking about. Then just take SJ of X to be psi inverse of X EJ. And EJ is the standard basis vector. And these are independent because this is a vector bundle isomorphism. So in particular, uh, fiber-wise, this is a linear map, and these are independent, so they're independent here, and everything works just fine. And for the other direction, well, the idea is to use this as a J as a basis, and this basically gives us coordinates, and coordinates is what gives us our K. So let's see it more in detail. So this direction. So we take, yeah, take a vector, x then of course there exist aj's in r such that v is the sum in j equal one to k of aj sj x and they're unique of course because uh, we say that sj of x is a basis okay uh, then define psi from E strict to U to U times our K. So this is the map that we will want to be our diffeomorphism, our vector bundle isomorphism, which is of course more than a diffeomorphism. And it sends V to well X comma A1 to AK. So you're just basically giving coordinates. And this is a vector bundle isomorphism. Uh, you can check this because, uh, of course, if you sum two vectors here, all you're doing is summing the these ajs. If you multiply by a scalar, all you're doing is multiplying these ajs by a scalar. Um, and everything varies nicely with the transition functions, because that's what we need for a bundle morphism, uh, simply because, yeah, when you Basically, what you're doing is just a change of basis. So here you get the same change of basis. Okay. Um, so we defined previously uh, global sections. And why would you, I mean, of course, usually when you define something, it means that they're usually interesting for some reason. Well, in the case for, of vector bundles, they're maybe not, I mean, they're not immediately interesting because vector bundles always admit a global section. And this is the so-called uh, zero section, which takes X and sends it to X zero. So this is, of course, technically, this is wrong. You should not write it like this because we don't have, I mean, EX is not a product. It's diffeomorphic to a product, right? Uh, but what I mean, of course, is just the zero element in EX. So sometimes you can write it like this. Uh, sometimes you write it like this. So the zero element in EX. It, it exists, is unique because EX is a vector space. Uh, but principal bundles instead do not always have a global section. 
and they have it only in a very specific case. So we have a global section if and only if it is equivalent and equivalent as a principal bundle. Uh, to the trivial one. So the only principal bundle that admits a global section is the trivial bundle. So, okay, one direction, uh, I think it's easy. So if we are m times g, uh, then the what would the um, so m times g admits x goes to x comma e. E is the neutral element of the group. Yeah, this always exists. It's there. Uh, no big deal. Uh, but vice versa. Uh, it's maybe a bit more complicated. So we take this global section. Global section. Uh, then we know that the, the group of, you know, the structure group of this principal bundle um, acts on this fiber. I mean, the fiber is basically G. So in particular, for every element, in the fiber here, there exists a unique uh, group element such that SXH is G. So if you remember, we have that uh, in a principal bundle, you have that the group X on the left because it's the transition functions, but then to define a principal bundle, we have this action on the right with the group G on the fibers. And we asked a few conditions in this, in particular, that the fibers were diffeomorphic to G. And this means that this element is unique. Okay. So I write G here, but remember, this is not an element of the group, it's just an element of the fiber. And the same, S of X is an element of the fiber. The action is transitive, so there exists an H. It's unique because uh, principal bundles ask that this is unique. And now, well, we have we have now kind of a translation. We, we can translate just an abstract element to a pair in M times G. So how do we do that? Well, you see on one side, we have one element G and one, on one side we have an X and we have an H. So we send G to X, H. And the inverse, of course, uh, we send X, H to uh, S of X times H. Because that's what it's saying. And this is also, um, it is, uh, Principal bundle equivalence, principal bundle equivalence. Uh, well, simply because when we act on the right, you're basically acting on the second component. So if you do S, X, H, G tilde, it's the same as doing G, G tilde, or G tilde, an element of G. Yeah, because remember uh, when we talk about principal bundle, basically you're saying that if you have x comma h g, h g tilde, in this realization, then you can kind of bring the g tilde outside. That's that's the idea. And outside means outside of uh, phi. Yeah, and this is precisely what he's saying because this part here is um, psi inverse, and this is g itself. So you bring it out, bring it out. And as a corollary, if you remember, we were talking about reductions. And um, 
we said that uh, a principal bundle can be reduced, is, is a group can be reduced if and only if we can find transition functions with value in the subgroup. And of course, the trivial bundle is always, it can always be reduced to a principal bundle with a trivial transition group. So it's trivial transition, sorry, tri with trivial structure group. Uh, so in particular, we have that the principal bundle, P principal bundle, admits uh oh, sorry no, no that's not what i want to say principal bundle is equivalent as bundles as principal bundles to the trivial one if and only if its structure group is reducible to e. So one direction, uh, okay, so proof. Uh, one direction is obvious in the sense that you take n times e into m times g just injection so this is the reduction yeah and i mean if you're saying if p is equivalent to m, m times g so this is p you just take this and this is the reduction uh, the vice versa is given by the fact that if your structure group is reducible to e there exists a phi from m times e to p this is the, the definition of reduction uh, but then the map x goes to psi of x e is a global section and from what we just saw p is trivial So sections and uh, this new knowledge about the uh, principal bundle, what a principal bundle E is, what it means, actually allows us to reformulate some definitions that we already knew. So, so this one is not about this, <laughs> this exercise, that's the next one. Uh, but for instance, if you have a Lie group, then it is parallelizable, parallelizable, meaning that its tangent bundle is trivial. Maybe you've already seen this in some other course. Uh, but of course, the idea here is to use the fact that, yeah, if this has dimension k, then you have to find k independent, pointwise independent sections. So that was the previous preposition. And of course, to find them, you somehow have to use this Lie group structure. And this other one is just a reformulation, basically. Oh, call it. So M parallelizable, if and only if the frame bundle, which recall is the um, principal bundle with the same transition functions as the tangent bundle of M, Is trivial. Okay. And again, this should use uh, what you just saw. So I think these are not hard exercises if you understand what we did today. Um, so I think it's good that you realize 
how to solve these exercises? Could that kind of enlighten, should enlighten you on all of this? Which, uh, yeah, it, it is phrased in a pretty abstract way. But then in practice, it's just rewriting things we already knew in more general terms. So once you have bundles, um, in particular vector bundles, we're interested about creating new bundles. So operations on vector bundles. Uh, so, for instance, one, one thing you know, if V and W are vector spaces, so I'll just, just good old vector spaces, uh, we know how to create new ones. For instance, we know how to sum them. We know how to take the tool of a vector space. Uh, we know how to take the set of homomorphisms, so linear maps between V and W. We know, maybe I'll put it here. We know how to take the tensor product of two vector spaces. And we even know how to take the external product, I think it's called in English, of this. Or alternating product, maybe. So, okay, you, you know all of this, you've seen all of this. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you've even seen the universal properties for this. Um, but one thing you probably didn't see is how uh, bases change. So for instance, if you have a basis of V and a basis of W, what is the standard basis? Is there a, some kind of standard basis for V plus W? Sure. No big deal. Okay, but what if we change basis in V and we change basis in W? What is the corresponding change of basis in V plus W? And why do we care about change of basis? Well, because when we deal with uh, vector bundles, our transition functions are basically nothing but change of basis. Okay. So we'll review all of this in a very abstract way. So we put an abstract vector space structure to these operations. So let's say that V, dimension V is K and dimension of W is L. Then P of VW, and this P you should think as a function of the two vector spaces. So for instance, it could be the sum, it could be the homomorphism, it could be the tensor product. It could be actually just a function of one of the two spaces. So for instance, the alternating product or the dual. So this is a vector space. of some dimension, R, which depends only on the two dimensions. So all of this satisfy this, yeah. And we see that P is a linear operation So this doesn't mean anything, this linear operation. That's why it's within brackets. Such that if we have two bases, one for V and one for W, then P of VW as a natural basis. which we call P of BV P W. So that's kind of what I want. Now, if you start with two bases on 
V and W, you are given also a basis of uh, this operation of P of VW. And also, if you have another pair of bases, so B, B V prime, and the prime is not on B, but it's like on B V. Other basis for V and W with base change matrices HV and HW. So HV is the transition matrix from BV to BV prime, and HW is the transition matrix from BW to BW prime. Then we're also given then uh, the base change matrix P HV HW from well P of B V B W to P of B V prime B W prime um, the base change matrix has entries so we're given this matrix yeah uh, and then one thing that we want is that the entries of this matrix must be polynomials in the entries of hv and hw okay So okay, we can we already so this is kind of just very abstract way to see all these basic operations that we already know uh, for vector spaces. What we want to do is transfer all this operation to vector bundles, and the reason we're doing it in this, this abstract way is that we don't need to do it individually for each one of them. We just have this kind of general structure, uh, and we can move all this structure to vector bundles. So now let e and f be vector bundles so f now is not a fiber it's a vector bundle uh, what of rank k and l respectively and then simply we define uh, uh, p of ef well that's nothing but the union of p over m this joint union of p of EP FP. So simply EP and FP are vector spaces, and so we know what the operation is, so the sum or endomorphism or whatever. And you just take the union of all of this. And then we take pi to be just a natural map. Natural map. And of course, on this, we put the topology, which makes this map continuous. So let's see how um, all these base changes work on this. Uh, um, so how the transition functions change. So let's take phi e and phi f local trivializations for E and F over the same set U. And of course, what we want to do now uh, we, is to define a trivialization for uh, P E F over the same set U. Because we still have to show, of course, that this is, in fact, a vector bundle. For now, it's just a bundle with, uh, well, we don't even know the transition function. So it just, it's just a so, submersion. So we define a realization from pi inverse of u 
to u times r to the r and remember this r is the r that comes from k and l as p of phi e df yeah which makes sense which takes an element uh, uh, which to an element of p dp fp so if we stay the fiber over a point we associate to which to an element uh, associates its coordinates uh, and to give coordinates, we need to give a basis. And of course, we just take the basis EP, B, FP. So we, we take a basis of uh, EP and FP. <clears throat> and an element here will have some coordinates in this basis. But of course, we have to say which basis are this. And the point now is to use the trivialization. So BEP is simply the standard basis in that realization. And the same for here. Okay, so let's let's recap before we go further. Okay, what what are we trying to do here? Uh, we're trying to show that this PEF is a vector bundle. Okay, so to show that it's a bundle, first of all, we need to find local trivializations. Okay. So to find local trivializations, we have to find the, define this map uh, psi from this anti image to u times r to the r. And why r? Well, because r is the dimension of this vector space. Remember, this r is r of k l. Um, but how do we define this realization? Um, well, the idea is to say, okay, we need. Well, let, let's take uh, the trivializations that we already had, so phi e and phi f. Yeah for e and f over u and let's kind of take the standard basis there so this is the standard basis there you see we start with this ej which are the standard basis and we just push them back with the trivialization okay so we have some standard basis for these things for these vector spaces then we are given by this operation p some natural basis for this uh, vector space, for this vector space, sorry. And yeah, we just take the coordinates in this basis for this new, for this element. So this seems again, very abstract. I think that this P is what makes everything very hard, but we will see the examples and it will actually be very easy and very natural. And uh, the beautiful thing now is this, if you think this Psi of Psi alpha, so using this Psi alpha, the transition functions for P, E, F satisfy C alpha composed C beta inverse P of A1 beta AR beta. So this is a, this is the trivialization. You have P and then a vector of dimension R. And you just uh, go back to this P of EF and then back to another trivialization. Then this should be P times the transition function, right? Of this new bundle of this PEF. Uh, times uh, this thing, 
And the beautiful thing is that the transition functions are precisely the ones that one might hope and expect. So G alpha beta E and G alpha beta F are the transition functions for E and F. In particular, the transition function for this basis here, for this standard basis. Yeah. And uh, this operation P gives us a new matrix, right? Uh, this one here, P, with entries which are polynomial, blah, blah, blah. And this one is precisely the transition function for the new bundle. So, examples. Well, you did you need it? Maybe. Okay. Example. So many examples. Let's start with the basic one. Direct sum. Uh, then this new trivialization is nothing but the sum of these realizations. Yeah, you just put, you have a, the first one as dimension K, the second one as dimension L, just put them together and you have something of dimension K plus L, and that's your R. And what about the transition functions? The transition functions for the sum are basically, well, you can't really say the, the sum of the transition functions, but it's this uh, block matrix. Because when you have a direct sum, they basically don't speak to each other. Yeah. So you can think that when you act on this, the first K components are only from E and the second L components are only from F. So they just don't speak to each other and everything works. Tensor product. Tensor product is a lot worse, but we will work out all the details. So maybe this also clarifies um, what we did in the abstract way. And it's mostly about recalling uh, everything from linear algebra. So we take a basis. V. So I'm not here. I'm not talking about just. I mean, of course, I want to talk about tensor product of uh, two vector bundles. But for now, let's just take two vector spaces, because what I want to do here is basically uh, compute this uh, this p of H V H V H W. Okay. So we take two bases. And now then we are given a natural basis, so as you know. And this natural basis is uh, VI tensor WJ, where I goes from one to K and J goes from one to L. It's a basis for V tensor W, tensor W. Okay, this is known. Now the question is, we take another basis in V and another basis for W, then how does everything change, right? Well, so we know, let's write, let's say the change of coordinates in V and the change of coordinates in W, so VI, it's going to be some i n v n prime. So the sum here is in n. And vj is going to be the same. We're summing in m. Oh, sorry, this is l. v j m w n prime. Then uh, we have this terrible, terrible formula that vi tensor vj. Well, what we want to do, so this is an element of this basis, right? 
and we want to write this as a linear combination of elements of the basis vi prime tensor vj prime. So this becomes this mass here. Is this mass? You just uh, yeah, you just simply just replace this with this and this with this, and then you use bilinearity and things come out and turns out is this. Um, so if you want to see this in matrix form, so of course you can think this a i n as L of, uh, as entries of a matrix, and also this one as entries of a matrix. Uh, this thing actually has a name. This is the Cauchy product. This is the Cauchy product, which surprise surprise is denoted by the tensor product symbol. And it looks really weird. It's a block matrix. So this is not commutative. So this is a block matrix where in the top left corner you put A11, so the first top left element of A, multiplying the old matrix B. So this is the first thing. And then here you put A12 times B. And you keep going until you have A1K times B. And below, okay, here you keep going until AKK. B. This is a k one b. So what's the dimension of this matrix? Uh, well, it's simply uh, l times k, which is of course the dimension of the vector space. Okay. And yeah, now if you kind of forget that these were elements of a uh, of some vector space, and you think that this were the basis of a vector bundle, right? And this is one the, the standard basis in one trivialization, and this is the standard basis in the other trivialization. This must have been the A and B must have been the um, transition functions to go from let's say alpha to beta, right? Then this is what you do with these two matrices. You have G alpha beta for E, G alpha beta for F, and you put this together. So let's do it. So the bundle, the vector bundle E tensor F is the rank R equal K times L vector bundle. So it's a vector bundle with fiber uh, R to the K times L. So R to the small r, big R to the small r. Uh, with the transition functions, because remember transition functions define a bundle. And you just take this, G alpha beta E, Cauchy product, I'm not gonna say tensor, I'm gonna say Cauchy product. This is a matrix. This is a matrix. You know how to do this. The hard part here could be to show that this satisfies uh, co cycle identities in principle, right? But the point is that we already know because this comes from just a change of basis in regular vector spaces. So they must satisfy all these um, uh, co cycle conditions. And yeah, and these are matrices, the satisfy the cycle condition, so they give you a bundle. Let's call it a E tensor F. That's it. Okay. Does it make sense? Anyway, tensor products are used mostly when uh, this uh, um, objects of dimension one, complex dimension one. We will see it, I think, already next week, hopefully. Uh, so this is so this is a function into C star. This is a function into C star, and the tensor product is just the product. So th things do become easier when 
when you actually study things of dimension one. Okay, let's do a few more examples. Actually, just one. It's there no product. So now our function p is this lambda. So how do we define the external product? We had this um, alternator. And this was a map from v tensor v tensor v r times. Yeah. Actually, sorry, this would be to the r. And it's defined, then you take v1 tensor tensor vr. So this is again only for vector spaces. Huh? This is defined as 1 over r factorial, and then you take the sum over the symmetric elements, k, and you take the sign of it. So um, you, you saw this at some point, no? And then readily forgot it because you know, that's, that's the kind of thing one wants to forget, I think. And you know, oops, you know that this is a projection, meaning that if you repeat it twice, you just get one again. And in particular, this implies that you can decompose this tensor product of uh, R copies of V as the kernel of A, which are the so-called symmetric points, plus the image of A. And you define this alternating um, alternating product of V, R times, as just this image. And usually write uh, v1 wedge vr for the image of v1 tensor tensor vr. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's uh, let's look at the case where r this r is the dimension of v. Yeah, so we're really taking k, copy, k copies. And as before, we take two bases, v1, vk, w1, wk bases. And we take the change of, mate, change, uh, change of variables within them, such that vi the sum for j from 1 to k of a i j v j. Yeah, so this is as usual, and we're trying to see how change of variables in this in our in v affects the change of variables in the alternate in the external product. So what we have to do is write an element of the basis. And remember that this has dimension one. So when you have r equal k, this object has dimension one. Where is it? The alternating, this, this has dimension one. And this is the, the standard basis element, w1 wedge wedge wk. Uh, this is nothing but the determinant of the matrix ij. Yeah. times v1 wedge and wedge, wk, okay? And uh, otherwise, so if uh, r is less than k, of course we know that if r is greater than k, this is dimension zero, so this is boring. But if r is less than k, then you have to take, uh, then you have to, take the minors of A. So A is the matrix AIJ. And yeah, you have to take the corresponding minors. So there is like no good way to write this. Um, uh, I don't think there is really a, a good way to write this, but you have to write this, uh, you know, v, W1, which W2 is the sum 
over over i and j of um, you know the minor with uh, i think it's row row one and two and columns i and j times vi wedge vj something complicated has to do with minors sorry what was a minor again uh, ah sorry okay that uh, <laughs> might be a problem <laughs> Uh, so a minor of a matrix is a sub matrix, which is square. Uh, sorry, uh, okay. the, deter the determinant of a sub matrix, which is square. Yeah, okay. Uh, um, so not, you don't only take though, so let's put it in purple. So let's say this is the matrix. You don't only take this once, let's say. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can also take, let's say one, two, three, four. This is a two by two mine. So the determinant of yeah. this two by two matrix made by, let's say the four coordinates, this is the so-called uh, one N, one N comma one N mm -hmm. minor, right? Because you take uh, row one, column N, row one, N, N, column one, N, N. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think this, I know it. So this, yeah. this, <laughs> thanks. It is the two by two. So you you take all this part. There is some combination with this. The point is that when R is equal K, there is only one minor, which is the determinant itself. So this mm -hmm. is what happens. Uh, in fact, this deserves a special name. Definition, let's say plus observation. I don't know. If uh, Oh, sorry, I, I forgot before this, I forgot, because this was all for vector spaces. So now we have to do the same um, for vector bundles. Uh, and guess what? The vector bundles take the minors of G. Alphabet A, easy. Now is the observation plus definition that if R, which is the amount of times that we copy this alter this space V, the same as K, which is the same as the rank of V, then the transition functions, transition, so remember, okay, then the transition functions for the K E. And remember, this is now a vector bundle of dimension one, so the transition functions are nothing but uh, functions which are never zero. And it's precisely the determinant of the old bundle. And for this reason, lambda k e is usually written as determinant of e is the determinant bundle. Of E. Yeah. And um, maybe, okay, now we know again, because we took all of this from uh, vector spaces, so everything works, but if one wants to show that in particular determinant bundle satisfies the co-cycle conditions, uh, then this is simply given by the fact that the determinant is a multiplicative function. No? So determinant of A times B is determinant of A times determinant of B. So everything works. And of course, determinant of identity is one. So it's fine. Mm, we do have other examples. Uh, I'm just checking how much. Okay, yeah, we can do one more example and then we'll call it day. And the last one is homomorphisms. Homomorphism intended as homomorphism of uh, vector spaces. So a local trivialization, trivialization for hom e f. So this we defined before is uh, basically point wise, you, you, fiber wise, sorry, fiber wise, you have a linear map. So it's given by psi alpha, which is hum 
V alpha E, V alpha F. So this again, we're using this um, abstract notation from before, but now we need to make it more explicit. So suppose E and F are trivial over some set O, U, and take, so we know that being trivial means that you have K independent sections. You say K is an L. Yeah, so this is, we take this uh, set of sections, which are uh, pointwise bases, okay? They're also usually called independent sections, meaning that they're pointwise independent. And now we can make up a basis uh, for, um, for this space of homomorphisms. So take F i j from E restricted to U to F restricted to U linear such that f i j of v m so we define it on the basis this is a linear map we define it on the basis v m is uh, kronecker delta i m times w j okay so you know the kronecker delta no this is one if I, I is equal m. So basically, i j is zero on all elements of the basis besides on v i, and it sends v i to w j. Yeah. So with this, of course, you can make all, all of them. You can take a linear combination of this, and this gives you a basis. And in particular, this f i j, uh, you can think of it as a section of u over you, I'm sorry, of this homomorphism bundle. Okay, so if, so we know that this is a basis. So if we have now an element over a fiber, so this is a homomorphism F over X, so maxing u, then you can write this f as a linear combination. So i goes from 1 to k and j goes from 1 to l of a j i, and you will see why we write j i instead of i j, of f i j. And um, and now our trivialization function, psi alpha, so alpha would be from this u. Is, oh yeah, yeah, u is u alpha. And psi alpha of x comma a i j. Uh, sorry, my bad, my bad, my bad, my bad. Space, calm down. Okay, psi alpha of f, so we need to find define a trivialization. So we have an element here over u. This f is just some element over u. And I have to tell you what it looks like in the trivialization. So we get x. And here we get this matrix a i j. And think in this matrix uh, a a j i as a matrix in L times K. So with this A, J, I, I, J, I mean the matrix which in position I, J as the element A, J, I. Okay. So this one outside is telling you the position of the matrix. And this one inside is just telling you what is there. Is this A, J, I. And the reason we do this is because um, this Fij is act actually lives, you know, once you apply it to something, no, uh, this lives in W. So dimension L. 
So when you sum with respect to j, this needs to be L of them. So that's why there is L of them, which makes some sense. And in particular, this makes uh, the change of coordinates um, very nice. So if we change coordinates in E and F, we so if we use the transition functions, we get that A alpha. So if we do this with respect to phi alpha, um, phi alpha E, phi alpha F, what you get is this uh, matrix multiplication. And this looks a bit different from what we used to, because uh, normally we have, because normally our fiber, when we talk about vector bundles, our fibers are vector spaces. So you multiply a matrix times a vector. But now we are imagining our fibers as sets of matrices, actually. Yeah, this our our fiber is this. Uh, um, our fiber is this map L times K matrices, because this is like endomorphisms. These are linear maps within E and F. So instead of thinking of a vector of length uh, K times L, it's easier to think uh, about it as a matrix of dimension L times K. Uh, but then of course, things change a bit. And this is how they change. And if you think about it, this is pretty intuitive, I feel. Because this A alpha is representing a map from E to F, right? And what happens, okay, and if you have this map and you change basis in E in the source, so imagine that here you want to apply a vector, no? A alpha of V, because this is a matrix from E to V. So forget that these are vector bundles, think just of vector spaces. These are matrix. So it determines in, in, a, in a given basis, it determines this linear map. But what if you change basis? How does the matrix change? And if you change it in the source, you multiply on the right. If you change it in the target, you multiply on the left. And the order here is precisely telling you that you're going from alpha to beta, applying the matrix in the coordinates beta, and then go back from beta to alpha. Um, so this concludes, no, that's a lie. Sorry, 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 last one, last one, promise. <laughs> uh, the dual, just the dual, but this is easy. Because uh, the dual, you can think as homomorphisms from E to the trivial bundle. Yeah, so when you think of um, the dual of, of a vector space, this is the homomorphism from the vector space to R, this is, from the vector bundle to this. And, um, and again, here we have this switching of indices in particular. So this now might be hard because I'm not telling you basically anything about this. Because I don't want to keep you forever. But one thing you should verify is what are the transition functions here? And this is G E alpha beta to the negative T. Negative T means taking inverse and transpose or transpose and inverse commutative. Okay, and this is, e. so basically what you have to do is remember how this varies, how this change of coordinates varies. But of course you can use this formula, so it maybe helps a bit. And the second exercise, Sir, oh no. Sir, size. Uh, proof that morphism from E to F is isomorphic to E star plus F. Um, well, of course, there's two ways to do this. You can either prove that they have the same transition functions. Hard, I would say, 
I would say very hard because then you you know you would have to take this matrix, uh, take the Cauchy product, and show that this is the same as doing this operation. Yeah, I don't know. This feels hard, especially because here you're really thinking this as you know that object. Another way is to find an explicit isomorphism, which I think it's a lot easier. Uh, so that concludes the lecture, the class for today.